Okay, AP Psych class, welcome to Unit 14, Part 1. Uh, unit 14 is over social psychology, and Part 1 is over social thinking. This is the last unit, so three more videos separate you from being completed with the Myers textbook. UP. Okay, so concerning social psychology, just a brief introduction here. Uh, social psychology would be the study of how we think about influence and relate to one another and so concerning um, you know, us as people um, personality would help explain why different people act differently in a given situation and then the added element would be social psychology would be explaining why the same person will act differently in different situations. And even though you may have little experience in the world of social psychology, it doesn't um, you know, take us long to think of personal examples in our lives of when uh, we may act differently dependent upon uh, the social context uh, that we're in or the situation that we're in. And so this is the branch of psychology that likes to study those sorts of things. Okay, so uh, our first section is on social thinking. And the first uh, topic to discuss is what's known as the attribution theory, okay? Um, or um, where we attribute behavior from coming from or where, uh, what do we think the source of our behavior is. Okay, and so basically uh, we tend to look at um, behavior as either coming from internal disposition, like just who we are as a person, or we can look at it as being situational, which would be looking at external factors or external situations. And so, you know, as a teacher, I see this all the time, right? A student that I may have in class that is super quiet and never says boo to anyone. Um, like I may see this student out and about, you know, I don't know, competing at open mic night at, at some local coffee house. And, and I'm always blown away like, wow, this person never says boo boo to anyone in school and they're very outgoing and, and talkative outside. So we could therefore conclude, you know, that you know the student is shy or that the student is outgoing it just depends on the external situation um, but her disposition uh, may get labeled differently dependent upon that situation so that's the basis of the attribution theory all right the fundamental attribution error is something that we are all guilty of we tend to overestimate the influence of personality and underestimate the influence of the situation okay so this is important to remember for future life people are always going to attribute your behavior to your personal disposition even if we tell them that your behavior is a result of situation um, so this is good to know because you can sometimes take a step back and take the role of observer and look at your own behavior to kind of help see how other people are going to perceive you. So even if I tell you, you know, in class tomorrow when I'm uber grouchy that, oh, I didn't get a lot of sleep, I had a rough night, you know, external situations are making me, you know, act like a total jerk. Um, most of you will still cl leave class and be like, wow, Daly's a total jerk. What a jerk. Uh, because we tend to attribute people's behavior to their disposition, not their situation. Okay. Now, concerning our own behavior, we tend to overemphasize the situation uh, and never that it's, you know, our disposition that makes us act the way that they are. So that's always kind of funny. Uh, what are some effects of this? Um, this can help you, um, honestly, um, I don't know, understand how other people are going to judge you. And if you can kind of anticipate how they are going to view you or treat you, you could probably change, um, you know, how you approach people or how you present things um, in, in order to, you know, interact and get along with others. Uh, attitudes and actions. Um, attitudes are our feelings. Um, they're often influenced by our beliefs uh, that predispose us to respond um, in a certain way to different people or events. Um, attitudes obviously affect our actions. And so concerning um, the way that, you know, people think or feel on different subjects, uh, we can talk about the central uh, root of persuasion, which means that um, 
an attitude can change a path because uh, interested people like focus on um, arguments or research, uh, well evidenced points, and that ends up you know changing their attitude on a topic. Um, or you can look at the peripheral route of persuasion, where uh, you know a person's attitudes could change because they're influenced, you know, by some sort of incidental cue, like the speaker's you know attractiveness or you know their fame or or something like that, you know. So um, both of those can play a role in how um, you know our attitudes and our actions can change as a result of um, external forces. Um, actions affect attitudes as well uh, so it works uh, the in the other direction as well so information can change your attitude which can in turn affect how you act but how you act can also work on the reverse and uh, the main idea under this topic is the foot in the door phenomenon which is the tendency for people that have first agreed to a small request to comply to somewhat of a larger request um, this is good uh, to know, not that I'm saying you should use psychology for evil, but uh, try to get people to agree to something uh, small and then build upon that. Um, so if you're trying to negotiate things, you know, with parental units or with teachers, you know, extending deadlines on a major paper, um, you wouldn't want to, you know, ask for a week right off the bat, right? Start, you know, like, what about just an extra day? Um, and then usually once people comply to a small request, like, oh, well, I already gave you an extra day, so what's an, you know, another extra day after that? Um, you can get um, much more, right? The foot in the door phenomenon. Let's see, how is this? Uh, how else is this used in the real world? Oh, I don't know, free samples, right? Like whenever you go to the grocery store or the mall, like, oh, just try this. Um, and then uh, I guess once you, you've tried something, they can get you to try it, then you may agree to, you know, buying uh, larger quantities of an, I of an item because, you know, you've already invested uh, in trying the sample out. Um, so it, it kind of gets, you know, the foot in the door, so to speak. Okay. Um, we know that role playing can affect people's attitudes as well or their their thinking uh the thing that is sticks out in the 40 studies book from the summer reading was the zimbardo prison experiment right um so when you take on a new behavior at first it might feel like you're acting but eventually you can kind of adopt a role as part of who you are um and so the prison experiment kind of showed us negative examples of that, but you could probably look at positive examples of that as well, right? Like, oh, I want to be a better student, then start uh, committing, you know, acts that um, good students are, are characteristically known for doing, and sure enough, you'll be a better student. Um, you know, I want to get in shape. Okay, well, small changes. Um, it may feel fake at first, but eventually, you know, that will become a part of who you are. Uh, cognitive dissonance is um, another example of social thinking that says that people will uh, want to reduce discomfort or dissonance. Like people don't like when things in their mind don't gel, right? Like when they have contradictory thoughts. That makes people feel uncomfortable. So if two of our thoughts or cognitions are inconsistent, right? That's how we get cognitive dissonance. So when two of our thoughts are, or more are inconsistent, then we're going to adjust something. And so if attitudes and actions clash, then you can adjust the attitudes or the action, okay? Um, the example that's given in the book uh, is about the Iraq War. Uh, when it began, uh, a lot of people supported it because they really did think that there were weapons of mass destruction uh, within uh, the Iraqi borders. Um, 38% of people said that the war would still be justified even with no WMDs, but when none were found, that a lot of people felt uncomfortable and so they changed the reason they supported the war um and so by 2003 there was a gallup poll where uh 58 percent of people supported the war even if no weapons of mass destruction were found because they were like oh well, we're there to liberate oppressed people so uh, because the action uh, didn't match their beliefs they ended up changing their attitude in order to justify that action um, so sometimes our attitudes follow behavior, 
uh, not the other way around, which is interesting, right? Um, the attitudes are internal, so they're a lot easier to change than, um, than an action that's already been done and is on record as having been done. And so that's a good example of cognitive dissonance. Um, yeah, so I guess I got ahead of myself there, right? Are attitudes or actions easier to change? Well, once an action's happened, it's happened. So attitudes, because they are internal, are, are a lot easier to uh, retrofit uh, to support whatever action was done. Um, and that's kind of interesting. So to relieve cognitive dissonance, we often change our attitudes. Okay, so uh, there's your basics on social thinking. Um, we'll discuss them in detail in class and uh, bring any questions that you may have with you at that time. Thanks for listening.